Hello again everybody and welcome back to Fuji Blitz and we're going to depart a little bit from the tanks in the game and we're going to focus on that other thing, history lessons. And today we're going to look at the five most infamous secret police organisations. Now when most of us think of secret police we think of James Bond-esque type things. Well they're not police, they're actually intelligence services. So we're not looking at those. That'll be a different video on a different day. We're going to concentrate on secret police, which ironically are in fact normal everyday police. And they generally fall under the auspices of the Ministry of the Interior or Home Office, rather than some form of military arm. The secret police come in many shapes and guises, and many countries have some form of secret police. But what we're going to consider are those organisations that were used primarily for state terror and the suppression of opposition. These are my top five, in my opinion, and they are in order of nastiness. So, kicking us off at number five, we have the Ministerium for Staatssicherheit. Now, excuse my German, I'm not a native German speaker. And to be perfectly honest with you, every single one of these is in a foreign language so you have to be there with me but this one the ministerium for Staatssicherheit, is actually better known by its more regular name the stasi the infamous former deutsche Demokratische republic or east germans police force which was founded after world war ii in the 1950s by a chap called wilhelm zeiser a german communist who had worked for soviet intelligence and the Comintern. Now the Comintern are communists worldwide and they're an organisation that advocated the spread of Soviet-style communism throughout the world. The Stasi itself was formed pretty much along the same lines as the then NKVD, but in its early years it really didn't hold that much sway. That all changed in 1953 with the East German Uprising, a construction workers' strike that eventually turned into a revolt against the communist regime of Ulbrich, which was eventually crushed. And Zeiser was removed because he was one of the people who tried to move against the DDR leader, um, Ulbrich, and, and he failed to do so. Ulbrich consolidated his power base with the assistance from the likes of Erich Honecker, this was the East German leader who famously brought us the Berlin Wall. And in 1955, the Stasi was returned and restored as a ministry. Many people believe the Stasi was similar or akin to the Gestapo. Well, that is simply not correct. The only relationship between the two of them was that they are both German, nothing more. The Stasi's main area operations was that of infiltration and surveillance, which they excelled in. According to many historians, the Stasi's infiltrations and such maintained greater surveillance over the population of East Germany than any other secret police force has in history. Simon Weisenfall, the Nazi hunter, even went further and he stated, in my opinion, the Stasi were far more oppressive than the Gestapo ever were. Unfortunately, I don't have many pictures or anything of the Stasi. I mean, they were a secret police force, which by their very nature means they are secret. And there's not much information out there about them, realistically. If you go to Germany nowadays, you can go to the Stasi Museum, you can look at the Stasi files. But in real terms, there's not much about the Stasi and what they did. Some people will show you pictures of them shooting people at the Berlin Wall. That wasn't the Stasi. That was the, the border police, effectively. Needless to say, the Stasi were incredibly oppressive. They literally had their finger on the pulse of what was happening in the whole of East German society until the falling of the Berlin Wall. Next up, we have number four, the Departmental Securitati Statuli. Now, following the defeat of the Nazis in World War II, many Eastern European nations fell under occupation of the Soviets and Romania was no exception, despite the fact King Michael was on the throne. Well, that all changed in 1948, when Georgi Dugiu Dai, the communist leader, abolished the monarchy and founded the Social Republic of Romania, along with Departmento Securitati Statuli, also known as the Securitate. 
Romania's secret police organisation. Whilst the Securitate didn't have the same level of surveillance as the Stasi did, its methods were broadly similar. But it wasn't until Nikolai Ceausescu came along and took over from George A. Day in 1965 that the Securitate became the brutal and oppressive apparatus of the state. Prior to Ceausescu, the Securitate had been oppressive. That is undeniable. But under Ceausescu, they took it to another level completely, with such activities as bugging the entire Romanian telephone network and infiltrating almost every aspect of normal Romanians' lives. Some of their most infamous operations include subjecting the leaders of a 1977 miners' strike to chest x-rays in excess of five minutes. This was in order to irradiate them enough to ensure they developed cancer, which a vast majority did. They also infiltrated the workplace, and they subjected women to regular maternity tests. They even went as far as infiltrating hospital gynaecology wards in order to check to see if any women had showed signs of terminating a pregnancy, which was a very serious criminal offence under Ceausescu. It's generally believed that the Securitate had one in four Romanians as informers, a number that is significantly higher than that of the Stasi. The truth, however, is somewhat different. The Securitate had closer to one in 43 informers, compared to the Stasi's one in 6.5. Nevertheless, it was still a highly effective, very repressive and brutal regime, more so than the Stasi in many respects. At number three, we have the Kenpatai. Now, the Kenpatai was one of Imperial Japan's secret police forces. They had quite a few. It was formed in 1881 and it was based upon the French Gendarmerie, the National Police Force. Initially, it was a military police force with no links to the civilian government. In 1907, the Kenpatai was sent to Korea to preserve the peace, which is where its transformation began. Now, unlike other state terror organizations, the Kenpatai was actually a branch of the armed forces, the army to be exact, and was answerable to army chiefs in its initial days, rather than to a civilian minister. In its very early years, the Kenpatai was not involved in mainland Japanese police operations. That sat with the civilian secret police, the Toko. However, Japan became more militaristic, especially during the 1920s and the 1930s. And the role of the Kenpatai began to morph and it eventually fell under the Home Ministry, which is Japan's Ministry of the Interior. Its power then increased further under Prime Minister Adiki Tojo, who was the Minister of War from 1940. Then he was promoted to Prime Minister in 1941, and he remained as the Minister of War and Prime Minister in 1944. Tojo himself had used the Kenpatai to great effect during his reign as the commander of Manchuria from 1935 to 37, where he released the brutality of the Kenpatai which eventually led to the forging of its brutal reputation. Whilst the Kenpatai maintained surveillance on the population of the homelands, Japan, and its occupied territories, where it ensured loyalty to the war and it stamped out defeatism, one of its more notorious acts was the running of Unit 731, which was also known as the Vivisection Unit, under Surgeon General Shiro Ishii. This unit, a branch of the Kempatai, subjected thousands of fellow humans to the most extreme of medical experiments, such as removing limbs or internal organs without any form of anaesthetic, in order to study the effects on how long the person would survive. In fact, almost none did. They also subjected approximately 10,000 Chinese nationals to numerous biological agents, such as bubonic plague or anthrax, again to study the effects, and again many, many did not survive this. 
In addition to these brutal experiments, the Kemper Tai were also responsible for the executions of the captured Doolittle Raiders. And these are the guys who flew out in their haul from um, the USS Hornet in their Liberator aircraft to bomb Tokyo just after Pearl Harbor. Now, many of the Doolittle Airmen, in fact, all of them landed in China, apart from one plane which landed in Siberia, and almost all of them escaped to safety. Eight didn't, however. Now, those that did escape to safety were aided by Chinese, which really didn't help the Chinese later on. The Doolittle capturees, of which there are eight, along with, it, the number is unknown, but it, we know it's thousands, were brutally executed by the Kenpatai. The Kenpatai itself, whilst a different kind of secret police, was still one of the most oppressive and brutal organizations of state terror, especially in those territories held by the Japanese, such as Korea and China, where murders at the hands of the Kenpatai number into the many, many thousands. At number two, we have the Geheim Staatspolizei, better known as the Gestapo, the infamous Nazi secret police unit that actually started life as part of the Prussian Ministry of the Interior and a regular police force under Hermann Göring, of all people. The Gestapo initially was set up purely as a political police force and it drew its ranks from the conventional police until it was seized by Himmler in a power struggle in 1934. That power struggle ended up where Göring was forced to hand over all the police units under his command to that of the SS. Himmler in turn placed the Gestapo under Reinhard Heydrich, who in turn brought it under the Reich Main Security Office, under Amt 4, a department for suppression of opposition, the very same department that Adolf Eichmann worked in. Despite the popular belief that the Gestapo was omnipresent, it was not the overly intrusive agency that we think of. There was no Gestapo agent on every corner. The Gestapo, despite movie makers' best intentions, did not walk around in black SS uniforms. They were, in fact, fully plain clothed. And yes, the leather overcoat and the funny little hats were common to the Gestapo. The Gestapo itself relied upon the assistance of other parts of the state machinery, especially the Kripo, or the criminal police, and the SS proper in uncovering dissent and opposition, which was its main focus. Now, they did receive great many denunciations, but they rarely acted upon them unless it fell under one of its areas, mainly because they discovered that many denunciations were made for personal gain more than anything else. The main focus of the Gestapo was related to political opposition, sex, churches, and finding Jews. Many historians believe the Gestapo operate what is called a selective terror campaign, which did not, it did not really intrude into the lives of everyday Germans unless they were political opponents, ideological dissenters, homosexuals, Roma gypsies, and most of, it, most of all, Jews, or those and those who assisted Jews. Despite this, the Gestapo remains one of the most brutal of state terror organizations, especially with its use of torture and its relentless pursuit of Jews for the Holocaust. The Gestapo were instrumental in the Nazis' final solution, and they were present and represented at the Wannsee Conference, where the final solution was finally put into effect. That is what places them so high at number two. Finally, we get to number one sitting atop of my list of infamous state police organizations is the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, by far the most effective, brutal, and oppressive of all state terror organizations that the world has ever seen. The People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs is more commonly known by its Russian abbreviation, the NKVD. Stalin's secret police force. 
Russia itself has a long tradition of state terror via secret police, from the Okhrana under the Tsars to the Chika under Lenin, but the NKVD takes state terror to another level. The NKVD proper came about in 1934, following numerous other organizations stemming from the Chika, which was the GRU and the OGPU. Its initial head was Jenrik Yagoda, a previous Chika officer. Yagoda was a brutal man, and this is evidenced by the use of Gulag prisoners to construct the White Sea Canal, which he oversaw, and had an estimated death toll of 25,000 dying during the overall construction. Yagoda himself was certainly a loyal servant of Stalin, and he is responsible for initiating the Great Purge of the 1930s, with the arrest of Kamenev and Zionev, following the assassination of Sergei Kirov, which, ironically, was apparently, and is alleged, was orchestrated by Yagoda himself, obviously with Stalin's influence. Nevertheless, Yagoda was brought down shortly after the Great Purge started by his subordinate, Nikolai Yeshov, who housed Yagoda, and is alleged to have executed him at the NKVD headquarters at the Lubyanka. Under Yagoda, the NKVD was nasty, yes, but it was under Yeshov that it really excelled in its brutality. Firstly, by executing all those NKVD officers appointed by Yagoda, followed swiftly by intensifying the Great Purge to a much wider remit. During 1937-1938, which was the height of Yeshov's power, with almost 75% of the Supreme Soviet and the military being caught up in the Great Purge, with almost all of them spending time in the Gulag, such as Marshal Rokossovsky, later to be a hero of the Soviet Union and one of its most able marshals. Not only that, a large number of that 75% were never released, they were actually executed. It has been estimated that 1.3 million were arrested under Yeshov's tenure, with some 700,000 being executed. Nevertheless, like Yagoda before him, Yeshov was eventually undermined by a subordinate, Laurenti Beria, who, like Yeshov to Yagoda, executed Yeshov in the Lubyanka and took his place. Whilst the Great Purge ended with Yeshov's demise, Beria was by no means a less brutal replacement. Under Beria, the NKVD murdered some 20,000 Polish officers in the Katyn Forest in 1939. And during the Great Patriotic War, which we know is World War II, his NKDV were used as what they called blocking detachments. These were units set up behind the Soviet attack to prevent any retreat. How did they do that? Well, they basically set up a line of machine guns and any Russian soldiers who didn't advance forward, they would shoot them. Beria's NKVD still sent a vast majority of people to the Gulag, but not to the extent seen under the Yeshov period. One of the more infamous of Beria's NKVD operations was that of the assassination of Trotsky in Mexico in the 1940s. Now, whilst Beria had halted the NKDV's main bloodlust during the war, upon the hostilities ceasing, the NKVD were once again unleashed, this time with the Doctor's Plot, which targeted Jewish doctors alleged to be plotting against Stalin. This was to be the NKVD's swan song, however, and with the death of Stalin in 1953, the NKVD was, a, was finally halted and Beria released many of its prisoners, including Molotov's wife. Now, Molotov was the foreign minister under Stalin, and his wife, Polina, had been arrested in 1949 by Beria for treason. Beria then dissolved the NKVD, renaming it the MVD, or the Ministry of Internal Affairs, which was essentially the NKVD in everything but name. Barry, however, eventually suffered the same fate as those before him. He was arrested and executed in 1954 under the orders of Premier Khrushchev, 
who then set about dissolving the MVD completely and rebranding it the MGB, which eventually became known as the KGB. For me, the NKVD is by far uh, the most brutal, oppressive and infamous of all secret police organisations the world has ever seen. The amount of blood on the NKVD's hands is outrageous and you really can't calculate or with any true reason or determination the amount of people killed and murdered by the NKVD. Um, I've been told there are places around the Moscow area where the NKD would murder their victims and then plant strawberries, which is just absolutely outrageous. Now, whilst there are many other secret police organisations that have been used to impose state terror that I have not listed here, and whilst all such state terror organisations are reprehensible, these five are, in my opinion, the five worst state terror organisations that have inflicted untold suffering upon its own people. Anyway, I have been Fujit, and that has been my top five of the worst and most infamous secret police organisations the world has ever seen. By all means, if you like this video, don't forget to like and comment, and please press subscribe. It's a lovely thing to do. And until the next time, stay safe out there, and be happy.